Tyler Johnson, thanks so much for coming on the Infinite Banking Podcast Radio, man. What's going on? How's it going, everybody? It's good to good to talk to everyone. Good to see everyone today. Nolan, it's good to see you. Uh, obviously, we saw each other uh, what about a week ago now. Made my way down to Birmingham, but uh, but doing well. Enjoying finally enjoying a little sunshine out in Nashville. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, hey, you know, I kind of gave you a, a little intro talking about uh, our friendship and and being teammates back in the day, but. Man, go into more about what you guys do, who you are, how you got into doing what you're doing, and, and kind of just take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. So as Nolan told you in the intro, him and I played baseball together for a little while. And then, um, you know, uh, originally from Southern California, my wife and I moved out to Nashville in 2018 um, and did some teaching for a little while uh, and then got into the financial planning world and uh, currently work at Peachtree Planning of Tennessee. Uh, so we have offices in, in Birmingham, actually, uh, home offices in Atlanta and, and say, uh boutique firm here in the Southeast. So, um, but what I wanted to talk about today was just uh, business succession planning. Uh, it's a, a issue, a, a hot button topic, if you will, in, in today's business world. And um, there's a lot of need in this area. And that's kind of where we, we fall into our, our planning process. Well, one thing that um, I actually just had a conversation with another guy in my office, because like I mentioned, guys, Tyler came down to Nashville, you know, just a week ago and was just talking about estate planning and succession planning and really higher level business that, uh, you know, we, we we focus on infinite banking. We talk about real estate, but nobody really talks about estate planning, like the way that Tyler understands it. So Tyler, can you kind of go into uh, not to redo your presentation again, but can you sure. kind of go into some of what, like, what are people experience? Some of the problems that people, as they build their business and they try and move it to the next, you know, generation and things. What does what is a typical client, or how do you solve a problem for them? Yeah, so estate planning is definitely a part of that, and and uh, if y'all are on the podcast, you don't quite know um, what your estate is. So as we talked about the other day, Nolan, it is everything you own, um, the the equity and everything you own, uh, including the death benefit and your life insurance. So um, interestingly enough, um, as always, as we talked about yesterday, the one thing we can hold constant is that Congress is always going to change tax laws. <laughs> uh, so uh, ordinary income tax rates change, but the estate tax uh, law is about to change as well. So um, right now, the exemption is about twenty four point two million uh, if you're married. Uh, but it's about to go down to about five or six million uh, by 2025. So, um, and every dollar amount over that amount, you get taxed and your heirs get taxed at about 40%. So um, visiting with a high quality estate planning attorney, you know, Nolan, you and I talked about um, islets and, and how those affect things and um, understanding how, you know, as real estate investors, you can start to discount uh, some of your investments in, inside of a, a trust. Um, but when we talk to any business owner, the real crux of our conversation comes down to um, the exit and the value of said business, right? So, so Nolan, I mean, you can answer this question for me, but if you were to, to describe a value of a business, uh, how would you describe that? Uh, I look at the value of a business based upon maybe some liquidity and maybe some equity in real estate, or maybe it's cash flow or anything kind of in between there. Yeah, that's a great response because it's it's a litany of things and it's a it depends on the industry you're in. So we really fall into this sphere of I would argue that most small business owners um, think they're going to sell their business at some point in time and don't quite understand what value they're going to get. And that depends on the industry you're in. It depends on the multiple you might get. And also it depends on about seven or eight different other factors that people might find your business attractive for. So the realism of a a a business selling to a third party is about an eight percent off of a twenty percent chance. <laughs> wow! Wow! So, yeah. So when you get to that point and you're maybe 60, 65 years old, you're thinking about exiting. The next step is really turning towards people that work with you, turning towards your, um, you know, your son, your daughter, turning towards a, a key person, and then it becomes a little more complex with the the capitalization structure. And then we start working with business owners on what their life looks like after the business closes. So. Um, Again, it, it's it's providing a three pronged attack um, to uh, business succession planning, but inside of that, um, doing things uh, like those tax efficient strategies, like having uh, a proper estate plan put together, um, and making sure that we are as tax efficient as humanly possible. 
So kind of go into some more of those details, like you mentioned, an islet trust and things like that. I mean, what does like if a typical business owner, like you said, is is trying to sell their business, if you had a manila folder style uh, <laughs> client, somebody comes into your office, maybe has a construction business doing five, six, $10 million a year. And they think, okay, I really would like to retire and sell off into the sunset here. What does, what does those steps kind of look like for somebody from kind of start to finish? Yeah, I think the first step would be, we probably want to talk to you at least five years out. Um, it is very difficult to transition a business within one to two years. Um, because uh, one, we have to identify business brokers, uh, M&A professionals, if you get into that level. But if you're coming to me with $10 million of revenue, um, we start to look at um, your EBITDA, right? Your earnings before interest, tax amortization. And we start to do a business valuation um, through our associate in Atlanta who does uh, unofficial business valuations. And we start to give you an idea of what you could potentially get in the marketplace, right? But along that line, the reason we have a five, 10 year span is because we want to provide all options. And I would say the biggest thing I run into is a business owner who gets to me when they're 65 years old, they usually have very minimal amount of money aside from the business. So that means you're putting a hundred percent of your net worth or 95% of your net worth only in the business. And now you're relying only on the business to provide for your retirement, which becomes a very tricky turnaround yeah. uh, as we talked about. So yeah, it depends on the business structure. It depends on um, who's in it. But again, I, I would argue that if you have all of your value in the business, then we really need to talk. <laughs> yeah, understood. Let's go into... Um more of the protection side of uh of sure. estate planning or succession planning or anything in between because again it's it's I'm so not educated or or well versed and god some of the stuff that we talked about is you you're just so sophisticated I'm not blowing smoke I'm serious oh. Um, <laughs> can you kind of go into some more details, at least on asset protection and how maybe go into some details, like what are trusts? Why, why are those important? How do we use those to protect our assets or at least pass those assets down, uh, to yeah. generations to come? No, absolutely. And, and again, I, I am fairly knowledgeable, but obviously we want to have the appropriate estate planner in the room, a, a person who does quality trust planning, but but, um, and that's what we provide as well, but, but trusts essentially allow you to move your estate into a separate entity, right? And that entity is uh, taxed at a certain rate. So again, if you are a person who has an estate tax problem, like again, let's say you have $20 million um, and the estate tax law changed and you can only push off 12 without paying Uncle Sam. Well, that's where life insurance comes in, right? Um, I mean, the, the, the building of cash value, whole life insurance inside of that is something that has been done for generations. It's actually, a, a, I mean, you're aware of this, uh, right? It's a uh, something the Rockefellers did back in the day, right? Um, the reason their generational wealth keeps building is because they keep moving. I think about it this way, right? So you have, um, what's it called? <laughs> the trust and it has all of your uh, estate in it. And then you can actually take what's called an islet and put your life insurance death benefit inside the islet so it's outside of your estate. So it. it reduces your amount that you owe to the government. Um, and there's other reduction strategies, again, especially for real estate developers. But it also allows you to, if you spend the money inside the trust in the future, it allows the death benefit in here to push back into the trust. You buy more life insurance, and then it goes into the wow. islet. You buy more life insurance. Um, and if you ever want to see a good case study of that, look at the difference between the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts. Again, great people in our area. Uh, the Vanderbilts ran out of money in, in about two generations, and the Rockefellers are still some of the wealthiest families on earth. But Appropriate estate planning with life insurance infused in that is a any good estate planner would tell you that's a uh, an asset that's well worth its while. Yeah, um, you know I actually met with a couple estate attorneys. I don't know, maybe like a month and a half ago, because mm -hmm. you know you always hear people say, "Oh, I want to you know I want to set up a, a trust fund for my kid or whatever it mm -hmm. is." And what these guys generally told me, and I'm generally speaking here, is that until you get to about $12 million in net worth, sure. it generally does not make sense to begin putting money into a trust. And maybe I'm wrong here, but just educate me here that yeah. I don't want to put any more, because in real estate, as we all know, the whole saying is buy, borrow, and die, right? We buy something, we borrow money, we yeah. die, and then we get that cost stepped up in basis to where our yeah. heirs are able to sell the property or do whatever they want with it based upon its today's value. But if we put that yeah. money into a trust, then that tr then they don't get that stepped up in basis. Can you kind of walk us through yeah. like what I just kind of said and what that looks yeah, no. like from a, another perspective? 
Yeah. And so what I was referencing the other week was kind of the some of the alternatives to like a 1031 exchange, right? So you're, you're talking about that, just push it off, push it off, push it off, and then um, die. But um, yeah, so obviously, again, seeing a good tax professional, and this is why it's good to have a good CPA and someone that's familiar with estate planning as well. But essentially what would happen if you put money into trust is that you would, you're right, lose the step up in basis, right? So again, when you die, instead of if you bought a property for 2 million, and now it's worth 5 million, instead of getting 5 million, your heirs would be taxed on that. Now, it comes down to the question of, what tax is worse. And then obviously in some trust situations, you get condensed tax brackets where you start getting taxed after $40,000 of income coming out of the trust. So, so again, so these things come in factor. Now, my argument would be if the estate tax laws change, then those things, I mean, you're going to get, your heirs are going to be getting taxed 48%, I'm sorry, 40%. And in a capital gain situation, it might be, depending on your income, 15 or 20%, right? So, it's kind of the the tax question, but again, if you have an appropriate life insurance policy inside of your estate plan, that life insurance can pay the estate tax, and then you can move on more money to your to the next generation. So, in any situation, uh, the appropriate amount of life insurance is is key. And you know, we we talk a lot about at least you know the infinite banking strategy, using cash value to go and purchase assets and to become your own banker and all that kind of thing, but. We never really expose the other side of it where it's talking about using it the death benefit as a play to take, you know, down some estate taxes. So can you kind of go into like a good scenario where somebody would come in? And again, we kind of maybe talked about this a minute ago, but I want to hear about a situation where somebody that has a business, they want to sell it. How can we use um what the the proceeds from the cash or from the from the, the sale would be? What would if someone was to sell a business and make ten million dollars? If you were their estate planner, or in this situation, how would you go about trying to protect that those proceeds? Because a lot of people, like we all know, is you work your whole life trying to build this business to exit one day, and then after you exit, the whole goal is just to not lose it or give it away to right. Uncle Sam. <laughs> so, how does somebody go in from building a business and earning and growing their you know this this awesome business and exiting? How does somebody go about protecting and keeping that money from creditors and mostly Uncle Sam? Yeah, no. And that's actually a it's funny because when you talk to a normal and so I do a little bit of everything, but when you talk to a normal investment advisor, they'll say do the four percent rule, right? Spend spend down four percent of your assets, leave it in a bond fund, whatever. But in reality, a better spend down strategy is to have some money sitting in life insurance for when markets are a little crazier, right? So when markets are crazier, you access the money in the life insurance and thereby you keep the death benefit more stable. So we use life insurance in that way as well. And obviously as the death benefit grows, when you have cash value inside of it, you know, then, you know, again, if you came to me and you had a $20 million estate tax problem, well, the conversation would be part, how do we mitigate that? Right, just with good trust planning, life insurance in the right place. And then the question becomes, what do you want to push on to your next generation? Because this is the only thing that we can be 100% certain of, right? When we do even business overhead stuff or disability insurance for, for um, uh, and buy sell agreements and whatnot for businesses, it's all a guess, right? We, we think that these things are going to happen and we mitigate them. But, um, but the life insurance is the only thing that you really can be certain that it's going to happen. And, you know, if you have a growth rate of, the dividends paying out five and a half percent. The company's quality. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't see why that wouldn't be. I, I don't know. Some people don't want to pass on money to the gen next generation, but I don't know why that would be a case. <laughs> yeah. Well, either way, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's you know the the best part about having the life insurance in the trust is that you are in control of everything versus somebody else. Can you kind of go? And I know our time's getting short here, Todd. I don't want to waste all your time here. Oh yeah. But can you go into some details about how? Because again. I really am not crazy educated on these. I would like you to go and talk into a little bit of detail. Like I know you you touched on being a trust, but what are who are the players in a trust, and how how does somebody again use a trust to offset some tax mitigation? Sure. Yeah. I mean, and again, it depends on the industry you're in. Um, but the most important thing is if you can get your life insurance in the islet, right? Technically, the life insurance death benefit is now out of your estate. So. If you had a $30 million total estate and your death benefit was 10 million, then technically your estate goes down to 20. Now, again, if you're in real estate, then we start talking about uh, what's called marketability and um, and minority interest discount. So if you're a minority partner in a syndicate, so you own less than 50%, you get a discount from the government basically for that, for the value. If you have a problem selling it, which every real estate developer does, then you get a marketability discount. 
for that. So you might be able to discount the value of your property. And we've been doing this with some real estate developers by 50% potentially. So you take a $20 million state, you turn it into an $8 million state <laughs> and wow. you still have all that money going. And that's again, the very basics of estate planning. When we, did, we need to do things that are a little more advanced, obviously that's why, again, these are all things we have lawyers in the, in the room with conversations, but, um, but just moving those things around and, and adjusting them and knowing what to do when and having the right professionals around makes a huge difference. Yeah. And it's something that, like you mentioned, it's um, it's OK to have a little bit of knowledge about and to be dangerous. But like you mentioned, I, you know, you really can't stress it enough how important it is to work with the correct professionals who do this every day for a living. They have all the documentation. They know how to do this. They've been through it 100 different times. You know, they understand situations. So well, somebody that's out there trying to figure it out, don't do it without yeah. using professional you know, help. Well, that's the first thing. That's the first thing I'll tell you. I mean, I know the I know the the general idea. I know what we're trying to get at. I, I know how to you know generate and move assets in a in a tax efficient manner. But I would never make that recommendation without a without a CPA or a lawyer in the room yeah. um, working together. So you know, when we do planning for people, it's very important to me because you know I've I've had professionals that just do. I mean, you've probably met people right back in the day just do investments, right? Um, and I like bringing all those professionals in the room because I feel like that's what business owners need. They need some, some comprehensive strategy. They need something that where everyone's talking together about their own finances. So, um, and, and again, especially as we start to de develop the exit, it goes beyond just estate planning. Now it's about the efficiency of your retirement, right? So can we take all that money and, and like I said, do things, um, uh, you know, like, again, look at things like opportunity zones or look at things that are tax efficient. And and those are just things that are of the option. But like I said, we always have the good professionals there to to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I want to do uh, kind of switch gears here. I wanted to ask you a little bit more because that's also some of your bread and butter is some real estate syndicates with opportunity zones. Can you can you kind of give us a 30,000 foot view of what a real estate syndication is, and then also what OZs are, what opportunity zones are, and how you yeah. can essentially couple all those things together to really not pay any taxes. Yeah. So syndications are are fascinating because essentially you can do a syndicate even when you're you know uh, doing hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar deals, whatever it might be. But as people start to get more advanced in the real estate world, syndications usually can. I mean, they might be four or five, six different people all investing money all at one time, right? So. Some people are limited partners, there's one general partner, and exiting out of that becomes a little bit tricky because what happens if people pass away? What happens if someone gets disabled? It's all a business structure, right? So, um, but with opportunity zones, it's interesting because, you know, it's just a way to, to mitigate capital gains taxes. So it's another one where I would never speak uh, without the appropriate, like again, Patrick Morelli was yeah. there last week. But, um, you know, it's just a way where you can sit in there and go, hey, I can take my capital gain and move it into another fund, um, a, a real estate fund. Uh, and over a period of 10 years, technically, the capital gain tax will be paid back to you and you get tax free appreciation on the back end while they're doing cost segregation and accelerated depreciation in that deal. So, again, it's one of those things where. You know, like any real estate deal you do, Nolan, you, you, there's risk going into the deal because of what if the deal falls apart? But um, but these guys, they've been in business for a while and they, they know what we're doing. And, and it's um, it's something that, you know, it's it's you can be tax efficient with those things. Well, another good point about that, too, Tyler, as you know, is opportunity zones or cost segregation studies, these bonus depreciations that Tyler's talking about. These are all incentives by the U.S. government. It's Uncle Sam trying to tinker with the tax laws to get us to do a certain thing. And opportunity zones, as you know, Tyler, like you're, you know, you'll say, is um, they're trying to incentivize us to maybe invest in some lower income areas or some maybe undeveloped locations in yeah. order to develop those spots to create some more property taxes, whatever it is. But there's always a a reason behind why that these tax laws are a certain way. So. Yeah. Um, so the cost segregations, we don't have to really dive into that, but can you, can you, I've touched on another podcast, but can you talk sure. about what cost segregation studies are and then what bonus depreciation is? Yeah. So that, that's, in, so technically let's say you own a, uh, like, let's say you own the Titan stadium, right? Okay. Uh, technically the stadium has a life, a lifeline, maybe like 39 years. Um, and then every little piece in the stadium has some sort of lifespan, right? So it's even, uh, even the, the concrete has a lifespan. So technically the government says you can depreciate 
that and basically take the taxes all in the first. Well, actually, now it wasn't 100. It was 100 percent depreciation. Now it's 80 percent. Uh, that changed recently. But um, but having a good professional uh, do a cost segregation study for you is is integral, especially if you have a newer property. So again, if you have you know develop a property in 2019 or 2020 and you haven't had it done yet, but the challenge becomes. If you don't hold it for three to five years, there's a possibility that the government can come back and, and recapture those taxes, right? And trust me, Uncle Sam will come after you. Oh yeah. So, um, so again, when you're when you're talking to professionals, it, it's like you talk to a guy. I do cost segregation. Well, okay, you need to talk to the people <laughs> who really do it well, and most importantly, can file with the government, can get your taxes right. Um, the last thing we want to do is have someone doing tax efficient things that are not tax filed appropriately. But you're right. All those things are allowable by the government. And if it fits into your plan, then those are you know some things we, we talk about intently. So long story short, then to come full circle, if someone is selling a business, they need you to build them out of trust. That trust goes and invests in an opportunity zone or Titan Stadium, gets a <laughs> bonus depreciation through a cost segregation study, and can eliminate their taxes. Is that right? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think that's the whole story. <laughs> but um, but no, you're you're right. It's like so that's the thing. Even if you, I mean, if you even if like no, let's be serious. Every business owner thinks about what they're going to do after, right? They just don't necessarily know who to talk to. And unfortunately, this this uh, like I said, this industry is kind of fragmented, right? You got to talk to sixty seven different people uh, to get one different answer. So. Again, we want to mostly plan around what you have going on, what you feel about certain things. I got a client recently who was like, I don't really want to push money on my kids. I'm like, okay, we can still be efficient with uh, some of the, the tax efficient vehicles that we use in planning. But um, but every business owner needs to be walked through um, what their succession plan looks like, because again, it is a lot more complex than just finding a business broker um, and Telling him you want to sell the business for X dollar amount. <laughs> 100%. And uh, again, Tyler, I know our time's getting valuable here. So one more thing here. And, and like I mentioned, guys, in the beginning of this episode, all of all of Tyler's information is going to be in the bio of this episode. So you can reach out to him directly, whether it's through email or his calendar link or however that he wants to, uh, you want to get in touch with him. But Tyler, just kind of go again really briefly over, you know, what you guys do at Peachtree Planning and how somebody can uh, reach out to you and what they can expect from your services. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we, let's start the business consulting planning, but it, it comes down into like three distinct phases. So first we do a personal plan because we believe, you know, when you go to business owners, they kind of have things separate, right? They have a guy doing personal stuff and a guy doing business stuff. Those two are intertwined. So um, we want to make sure that that is all taken care of. Uh, things are mitigated and then we do a business valuation. And then, you know, step two is really understanding the particular exit you have, understanding how to retain key employees, incentivize those people through different um, compensation structures. Um, and then it's all about tracking those things over a longer period of time and seeing uh, when it gets to that point, finding a business broker or the right estate planner uh, to do those things. So again, my argument is that every business owner is thinking about this right now. But also, if you're thinking about doing um, individual planning as well, I'd, I'd love to meet with you. Um, no one's, you know, no one does a good job of talking about infinite banking and the, the benefits that has. And and uh, I believe in a lot of the similar things as well. So, um, you know, just understanding the, your own individual life and and how to be a little more. Uh, creative than just putting money in a retirement fund. <laughs> Man, 100%. And that's and that's kind of the whole main goal of this podcast anyway is just for people that think outside the box and they're not they don't just do what they're told by uh, Dave Ramsey and the other financial entertainers out there. And so, yeah. but uh well Tyler, man, thanks so much for coming on. If you got anything else, um Love to hear, it, but man, we're we're excited about this. Again, this is uh, guys. Tyler Johnson is a rock star guy up in Nashville. He's a really good buddy of mine. We we think on uh, very the same wavelength. And um, again, Tyler, man, thanks so much for coming on, brother. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for. Uh, I love all the uh, the great questions about estate planning and and you know taxes and stuff like that. So uh, thanks for having me. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, yeah, reach out to me. I'd love to speak to you more about uh, your own particular financial situation. Cool, awesome. Thanks, Tyler. Talk to you, man. All right.